I think there's a big um, misconception in the public, not not the medical professionals or people that are aware of what's happening. And just because we flatten the curve doesn't mean that the virus goes away, that this will probably be around for quite some time. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. It is something that is going to be lived with for a while. I mean, we'll see. It's it's something that, you know, we look at it. I'm sure a lot of people do this. They look at it every day and say, oh, you know, there aren't as many cases today and maybe it's it's going down. The curve is certainly flattened. The original justification for the lockdown was we don't want ICU overwhelm because if we have ICU overwhelm, um, there are too many patients for the ICUs, then the mortality rate goes up significantly. Well, that hasn't happened in almost all of the country outside of a couple areas of New York and New Jersey and a uh, few, other, few other cities where there are hot spots. And, and that will happen o- o- over time. But those cities may want to look at shutting down earlier. And, and in order to make those decisions, better testing has to happen. In looking at just how different countries are handling this and when we look at like China and um, Singapore and they seem to have everything at least Singapore seem to have everything kind of under control and now they're experiencing another wave of infections what do you think that's due to and how can we be different it's a good question uh, they I mean it's due to the the, the fact the nature of the disease that it has a high uh, R zero value, uh, you know, estimates range between two and five point seven, um, so it's very communicable. Um, it's basically a threat to people with pre-existing conditions. This is something I don't think is emphasized enough. That you know, young patients, yes, you you will hear those stories about you know young patients uh, succumbing to it and dying from this. Um, but that's the overwhelming minority. Uh, most patients, especially if they're young and healthy, meaning you know under four, under fifty, under sixty, without pre pre existing conditions like obesity or hypertension or high blood pressure, uh, without uh, chronic lung disease like COPD, uh, without diabetes, um, you know it, it's not a it's not an illness that you know you can look up your um, your your own infection fatality rate for your age and demographic or there were some calculators online which are pretty good about it. And what about, let's say things start opening up and do you feel like there's a proper plan in place in case there's another wave right away or even with the second wave, if there's any program in- implemented that we feel good about? Yes, yeah, some states are going to handle it better than others and some governors and their teams are going to handle it better than others and we'll be able to see basically, you know, what works in what states uh, and and when. Obviously, you know, testing of, of general population is very important, being able to test and, and you know, the tests are accurate. That's one of the problems with a lot of the tests. That they're not, uh, you know, perfectly accurate. Um, and then, you know, how fast does it take to get those tests to turn around here in Puerto Rico? Uh, I'm told it can it can take days. In other places, it can take uh, you know half an hour, depending on the test and, and where you are and what kind of test they're doing. It seems so interesting because you know even if testing is available, how often are people going to be te- you know getting tested? Because you got one test great and then you're exposed an hour later. What is that? You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. You know, but in terms of having a, a broad national yeah. plan in place to uh, to test, we're going to test only people over a certain age with only certain symptoms. You know, I'm not sure that's the ideal approach because a one size fits all policy doesn't necessarily apply to you know rural Montana mm-hmm. or here in Puerto Rico what it would in New York City. And what do you think about this the antibody testing? Um, how was that? helpful right now is there any research on that what is yeah there, there there's there's not uh there's not a ton um that's definitively known uh about uh, ability to acquire it a second time um in general uh you may not get it uh, as bad a second time if you are going to get it you know down the road um a large majority of patients do develop antibodies but not all in detectable levels um, some of those can be useful for uh, for plasma donation, mm-hmm. um, convalescent of plasma, but um, uh, it may be, it, it, I think it's too early to definitively say. So how are we supposed to get back to life when there's all this unknown? What is your opinion on just 
getting back to normal or is there going to be a brand new normal that exists? I, I mean, I think it, it's going to be a combination of both. I think patients who are not sick, patients who are under, you know, whether you want to use a cutoff of 40 or 50 or 60 or 65, patients who are, are relatively young and patients who don't have uh, conditions. Um, and the, long, the younger you are on that, certainly if you're under 45 uh, without a condition, you can continue to live your life without any significant risk at all. I'm not worried about this at all for, for me or my family. I'm 41, um, got three young kids. The, the odds of, of them getting this illness and having a serious uh, complication from it or death are, are, are just it's tiny. It's not even worth discussing. And, you know, for patients uh, who are older and have diseases, uh, significant comorbidities, they should be uh, take a more cautious approach. Uh, and, um, you know, it can't hurt if everyone wears masks. You know, another way to, to look at it is, is the, if approximately half the population, it might be 40% or so, does not have a chronic uh, condition, uh, like we talked about, that puts you at risk. So the, the more patients like that who, who get this illness uh, from living their life, um, and the more herd immunity that will likely eventually develop, uh, the more of the at-risk population's lives that will be saved. Uh, from from this, I mean, in other words, if you were if you were gonna if you're gonna pick who's gonna get COVID in the population in, in the country of, of the United States of 330 million uh, to save the maximum number of lives, uh, you should really pick all the the young healthy people should basically get COVID 19 if you had to, right? I'm not saying you should try to get it, but if you had to get it, because if you were to only give it to the people who are older and who have pre existing conditions. You know the the mortality rate is the infection uh, uh, fatality rate is going to be much much higher, like orders of magnitude higher than if the young get it. So, uh, so you know, let the young get it. If they spread it to themselves, it's not nearly as um, as severe a problem as if it spreads through a nursing home, for example, or an elderly community. There's a lot of information going around and a lot of divided opinions. What do you think that people should be listening to and paying attention to? And what's your overall message? That's a good question. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, a lot of the media is biased in one degree, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. But really, this is, you know, an, an economic problem and decision. Um, you know, the, the experts in epidemiology will say, well, we should never open up because that's the way to minimize lives lost due to COVID. Well, they're not thinking about yeah, okay, lives lost due to COVID, but what about the lives lost due to delayed cancer treatment? What about the lives lost due to worsening diabetes care, worsening hypertension, worsening uh, uh, stroke care? You know, strokes kill a lot of people too, and they, they create a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, morbidity. You know, uh, if someone can't walk, they have to be cared for for the rest of their lives. So there are a lot of other, a ton of other medical conditions that the COVID epidemiologists may not be thinking about when they, when they try to max, you know, it's, it's kind of like they're trying to maximize or minimize the damage due to COVID. You may be creating a lot of other problems by having the wrong policy. 